Uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, allow me to say it's a really great uh, privilege to be asked uh, to speak at the McGill Summer School um, this year. Uh, the first and last occasion on which I did so uh, was two years ago. Uh, and while sometimes I think it may seem that nothing ever changes, if you actually think back about how much has changed uh, in the last two years, uh, it really has been phenomenal. And of course, all of it uh, has been witnessed and documented by the media. We've experienced uh, an absolutely huge upheaval in our economy uh, with the arrival of the IMF, um, major adjustments in our public finances, and the rebalancing of our economy away from construction and property uh, back to one based on productivity and trade. A few two years ago, uh, even at this event, uh, would have predicted the upheaval in our politics, which would have brought to an end the 70-year history of the two-and-a-half party state, Fianna Fáil, followed by Fine Gael, uh, followed by Labour. Uh, and few two years ago would have predicted that uh, once wealthy and powerful men, uh, the then masters of the universe, uh, would be seeking uh, jail. And few uh, two years ago would have predicted that the euro, uh, the second reserve uh, country of the world, uh, would be at risk. Uh, and indeed at this event, um, roughly two years ago again, uh, many commentators uh, and economists uh, predicted that Ireland would default, that we wouldn't be able to uh, manage our debts. Um, and deep down, I think a lot of us probably thought that they might have been right. Uh, but as I speak today, um, we have this morning uh, the NTMA uh, for the first time since September 2010 uh, issuing on the markets uh, long-term bonds, uh, eight-year bonds, uh, the auction beginning this morning uh, and finishing at 4.30 today. Uh, and should that auction be successful, um, I think it will be a remarkable achievement uh, to be able to return to the bond markets and sell uh, long-term government debt uh, in the context of what's happening uh, on the markets and in other countries in the Mediterranean. It will show uh, how far we've come uh, in a two-year period. So who can predict where we're going to be in two years' time? I, I certainly dare not. Uh, and I think, as the old Chinese curse would put it, uh, we are destined to live in interesting times. But what we can be sure of uh, is that the media will be there to report, uh, to inform, to analyze, and indeed to influence uh, whatever takes place. Uh, the, the topic of this session is the media and democracy, uh, rights and responsibilities. Uh, I think the discussion will be a wonderful opportunity for a politician at the end of a long and busy parliamentary session uh, to have a go at the media uh, and maybe to settle a few scores. Um, <laughs> and uh, indeed, um, indeed, that is tempting. Um, <laughs> But, um, uh, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, might, I might a little bit later on, but I'm not going to do it initially. Uh, so what I really want to do first is to tease out the essence of this debate, uh, which is the media uh, and democracy, rights and responsibilities. And I think in many ways, uh, politicians and journalists have a codependent, uh, almost uh, symbiotic relationship. Uh, we don't always like each other. Uh, we don't necessarily trust each other, but we do need each other to survive. Politicians need journalists as the medium through which we can communicate to the public our ideas and policies. And journalists need politicians as well to give them information uh, and content for their articles and broadcasts. I think the starting point for this debate has to be a recognition that there can be no democracy without a, a free press. As the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, put it, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate for a moment to prepare the latter. Secrecy is the enemy of democracy, and democracy is predicated on the belief that the public, properly informed, will make the right decision in their own interest and that of society. As John F. Kennedy put it in a famous address to the editors of American newspapers, in a free and open society, there can be no place for secrecy, secret societies, secret oaths, or secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the concealment of truth or pertinent facts and relevant information far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. And today around the world we still see societies, many powerful ones, where the news is censored, debate is stifled, mistakes are covered up, and the facts that the public have a right to know are withheld. We see in many parts of the world that the force of the state is used to ensure that policies are concealed, not published, mistakes are buried, not headlined, dissenters are silenced, not praised. These are societies in which no expenditure is questioned, no rumors are printed, and no secrets are revealed. Uh, it's my view that no government should fear scrutiny of its plans and actions, 
For from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. Without debate and criticism, no government will succeed, uh, nor will the country that it serves. Indeed, in the first days of the Greek city-states, the, the first republics, it was decreed a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy and fail to speak his mind. And that should be our motto too. Uh, at least it is my motto, uh, even if it does ruffle a few feathers from time to time. Uh, and we should recall that our constitution, and I quote, guarantees the liberty for the exercise of the following rights subject to public order and morality. The right of citizens to express freely, freely their convictions and opinions, including criticism of the government. And the rights that we afford the media are not given so that the public can be amused or entertained, nor so they can emphasize the trivial or the sentimental, but to inform, to educate, to stimulate, to reflect on the great threats and opportunities that challenge our society, to explain our choices, to identify our crises, uh, and to anger when necessary. And the greatest courage is not to tell people what they want to hear, or to give them what they want. The greatest courage is to tell them the truth and to give them what they really need. And we can think of many examples where the media and the media classes have exercised these rights to great effect. They include the early photojournalists who documented the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl and spurred the New Deal. They include the war reports from Vietnam and from Bosnia and from Rwanda that changed public opinion and therefore changed policy. Things like Watergate, uh, in this country the exposure of child sex abuse scandals, and of course investigations into the finances of some of our most senior political figures. But we can also see other examples where the sole objective was a different one. It was to get ratings, or worse still, get a scalp. Uh, these extend from newspaper reports about the children of public figures, uh, for example, children of politicians being expelled from school, uh, or the unfair hounding out of office of ministers in this state and others, uh, merely for passing on routine queries to the relevant authorities. Uh, and of course, the infamous primetime investigates controversy and the false allegations are made against Father Reynolds, uh, or the general sense sometimes that current affairs programs must be dumbed down uh, in order to reach a sizable audience. Uh, the media, in my view, has a responsibility to democracy uh, to uphold the sort of free and pluralist society which makes a free press po possible. Uh, yet too often it fails up to live to this responsibility. Uh, one day it may even devour the body which sustains it. Uh, some politicians rather cruelly regard the media as a sort of parasite that, that feeds on the body politic. Uh, I don't agree with that analogy. Uh, but I am concerned that the media now risks harming itself uh, and therefore damaging uh, the body politic which sustains it. Uh, the most recently published Edelman Trust Barometer makes interesting reading. Uh, it shows that in Ireland, uh, at 35%, uh, the media is no more trusted uh, than the broader government. That's actually unusual in a Western society. Uh, usually the media is more trusted than the government and probably should be. Uh, and actually, and I suppose even of more concern, the trend uh, is interesting too. Uh, the trend in trust uh, for the media is falling, uh, and the trend in trust for government, by which I mean the broader government, not just uh, the government parties, uh, is actually starting to increase again. But at 35%, uh, neither the media nor the broader government sector uh, are trusted very much. And I can't, can't help thinking that irresponsible uh, reportage is as much to blame for that. Uh, as irresponsible policies or politicians. And I think in some ways at the heart of it is the fact that the media don't always understand the public uh, in the way that we do. Uh, to them, public opinion too often is reflected by the person who rings into talk shows, uh, is willing to appear in a studio audience, uh, or writes letters to the editor. Uh, when you spend time knocking on doors or just talking to everyday people at meetings, at matches, at public events, you get a very different impression uh, of the public. And I think Tony Blair sums it up really well in his biography. And he says, to the media, a person is not a real person unless there is anger and preferably rudeness. Yet the truth is most people don't behave in that way at all. Most people are polite. They may disagree, but they do so reasonably. And what we have more and more is a celebration of the protest by the media. And the more people realize it, the more they tend to disrupt. That's unfortunate because any argument conducted in heat is a clash of views not an exchange of views, but no matter, it's news. Now, I think one of the most frustrating aspects for government ministers has been the demand and the constant demand uh, from, uh, from, from the media and from others for real political reform, 
coupled to their total disinterest in it when it actually happens. Um, and objectively, this, this government has implemented more political reform in a year and a half than the last one did in three five-year terms. Uh, there are symbolic but important measures, like a further reduction in minister salaries, getting rid of state cars, reducing the number of junior ministers and Rochdale's committees, reducing the size of the doll and number of local authorities, and all those things. But there have also been very substantive reforms. Uh, for example, all new chairmen uh, appointed of state companies must now be approved by an Oireachtas committee. All appointments of state boards are publicly advertised. Ministers, and I'm, I can't believe we actually signed up to this, but we did, and you can't get out of it now. Uh, ministers now take their own adjournment debates in the Dáil uh, and the Shannad and have to take follow-up questions for the first time. They can no longer get away with reading a script or getting a colleague to do it for them. The Dáil sits longer and later than ever before. Uh, and important legislation goes to Rochdale's committees in draft form at heads of bill stage, uh, whether it's the clamping legislation, uh, the bill to merge the labour relations authorities, the, the bill on, on, on personal solvency, uh, all those now go to committees before they're actually drafted. And that's a big change. Uh, in the past, only the social partners got to see the bill uh, before it was drafted, and then the doll rubber stamped it. Um, and to me, watching Oireachtas committees scrutinise public appointments uh, or examining line by line the heads of a bill uh, is watching legislators doing the business they should be doing. But the loneliest place in Enster House are the seats reserved for members of the press down in the committee rooms. The 20-minute Punch and Judy show at Leader's Question Time just makes better news. And for the first time in decades, we've seen a state of independent senators appointed by the Taoiseach. Uh, we now have Friday sessions to allow TDs to bring their own bills to the floor of the House, uh, some of which have actually been accepted, which is the first time that's happened in a very long time. Uh, funding of political parties is being related to gender quotas, and there will be a requirement that at least 30% of the candidates in the next general election uh, are female. An effective ban on corporate donations is being introduced. Uh, lobbying is being regulated. Whistleblowers are being protected. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act is being strengthened, not weakened. Uh, and a constitutional convention is being established. And I think perhaps if you spend too much time reading the papers, or listening to the radio, or maybe even attending summer schools, you'd think that nothing was being done uh, to bring about the new politics in our state. And of course, a lot more does need to be done. But this, and what's been done so far, is only a start. It's only 18 months into a five-year government. But for those who do believe in reform, uh, for people like me and my colleagues, for those who really embrace the new politics and believe in it, it's harder and harder to maintain momentum and to win the internal battles for reform when we get no credit for what has already been achieved uh, in such a short period. Uh, and I know there's been some criticism in particular of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, there's criticism that it has a limited agenda, uh, and there's criticism that it will be used to delay reform uh, rather than to uh, embrace it and to speed it up. And I can understand where that comes from, uh, but the agenda is not limited. Uh, this is a new departure. Uh, we don't really know how it's going to work out. It's 33 pol politicians, 66 people identified from among the public, and we want to start it off uh, with a small number of simple questions to see how it works. Uh, and if it does work as a convention, we can then put more and more items before that convention. And the intention is that, is that within four months of the convention making a report, the government will then respond uh, as to whether or not uh, we accept the recommendation uh, and whether a referendum is required. Um, another issue that I know gets great debate, and it got debate here yesterday, is the issue of electoral reform. And uh, I have an open mind on electoral reform, um, but I think we need to be careful about it and not make the mistake of thinking that any change is necessarily a good change. Uh, there are two countries that use our system of single transferable vote PR. Uh, one is Malta, uh, the other is Ireland. And academic studies have been done of those two countries. And the way people interact with politicians in those two countries is totally different. Uh, in Malta, even though it's a small country, and, uh, parliamentarians are not asked to do local work in the way uh, they are in Ireland. So if the reason that we have localism in Ireland is probably more to do with the weakness of the local government and not to do with our electoral system at all. So if you think by changing the electoral system you're going to change that, uh, you probably find yourself uh, mistaken. Uh, and also we need to understand that even if you do change electoral systems, you don't necessarily choose to change the basic rules of politics. Um, somebody I know is a member of the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament, and they have a totally different electoral system uh, they elect 120 members on a single national list. You just vote for a party, you don't vote for a person. So the most important thing for any politician is to get a good place on the list. And how do you get a good place on the list? 
uh, well, Offer, who I know, goes to as many bar mitzvahs as party members' children as possible. Uh, in Austria, for example, there are lists and positions dedicated uh, to women. And the way you get a good place on the list is by buttering up the women's group within your party. Uh, the same thing applies in Portugal uh, for the youth. Um, you have in other countries people get on lists because they donate monies to the party uh, or because they support the party in other ways. So we shouldn't necessarily assume that a list system will change the composition of our doll. In fact, it actually may make it more remote uh, from the people uh, and more dominated uh, by inside political interests. And whatever change is done uh, needs to be one that's going to work and achieve what we want it to achieve and not just change for the sake of it. Um, another issue that I, I think amused me a little bit about media, media reportage is, is conflict in government. Uh, there is conflict in government. Uh, of course there is and there should be. Uh, we've tough decisions to make. Um, there are differences of opinions between the two parties among 30 different ministers and over 130 parliamentarians. Uh, and those differences can be profound. Uh, but they're also regularly exaggerated. Uh, very often I learn about them from the press uh, rather than from my colleagues. Uh, and very often conflicts are disagreements that begin on a Monday morning and have been resolved on a Tuesday afternoon are still being analysed in the Sunday papers and the Sunday radio shows five days later uh, when everyone involved in them have long since moved on. Um, the fact that there are differences uh, in government and among politicians really shouldn't be a big story at all. It's the right of the media to report on natural and norm normal differences uh, in, in the government, but it's their responsibility to expose and challenge groupthink in government and consensus in society, and I don't think that happens enough. I also think politicians probably need to be more willing to stand up for themselves a little. If you take a simple example, uh, the government jet, uh, and incidentally I've never been on it in case anyone wants to ask, um, the, um, the, the government jet now carries ministers so rarely that the pilots have to go on training flights with no passengers at all <laughs> uh, in order to keep up their hours. Um, so to feed the lions, ministers travel out late at night for meetings in Luxembourg, stay in a hotel at the expense of the taxpayer, and lose most of the day uh, travelling home just to attend a two or three hour European Council meeting in Luxembourg. In the process we miss all debates, miss important media interviews, and miss important domestic meetings at home that we would like to attend. Uh, and with the European presidency coming up, uh, and the demand to stay, spend a few days every week in Brussels or in Luxembourg or Berlin or Frankfurt, it's hard to see how continuing the current policy will allow us to do our job as presidents of Europe properly, let alone well. Uh, and going into government is, is a very interesting experience. I have to say I really love my job and I'm really uh, grateful to have the opportunity to serve uh, as a minister in government. Um, but it's a huge shock when you go in there uh, because you do go into a government department uh, run by civil servants who are very good people and whose heart is definitely in the right place. But most of them have been there since they were 16 or 18 and will stay there until they're 60 or 65 and they see things differently and their time scale is different. They have a different view about what happened in the past and they have a different view of what should happen uh, and when it should happen. Uh, you have maybe 30 government agencies under your remit, uh, all with boards who you had no role in appointing, all with chief executives and management uh, who uh, were there before you and will be there after you. Um, and there is um, an, an old joke that kind of goes around uh, public sector circles uh, to say that in some ways um, the system uh, can treat a reforming minister a little bit like German occupation. Uh, you just um, ride it out for three or four years uh, and after he's gone you shoot the collaborators. Um, and, um, and that really brings me to, to, to the next point, which is uh, another issue that I think has been misreported in, in the interests of the Irish public, and that's the whole debate about special advisers, which in many ways has become rather absurd. Uh, yes, we did mishandle the issue of the pay scales. Uh, whatever rate was set, it should have been adhered to. But the whole issue of special advisers is a much broader one, and special advisers are essential if government is to function in the interests of the people. First of all, the title special advisor is a total misnomer. It sounds like a ridiculous job. It sounds like somebody who just sits in an office and every now and then they're asked to dispense expert advice. Um, and that's not what they do at all. Uh, special advisors are the people who do what the civil servants can't do or are not allowed to do. For example, they might be your press officer. And a press officer has to be somebody who's a background in politics or an understanding of the media, preferably somebody uh, who's been a journalist. 
And that's something that a civil servant can't do because civil service press officers just pass through the civil service press office between, between their time in the policy office and their time in the private office. Uh, they might, for example, be your parliamentary liaison staffer and that's the person who deals directly with the parliamentary party, with committees, with the chairman of committees uh, and with TDs to ensure that they understand what you're doing and to get them behind it. And again, that's a highly political role and cannot be done by a civil servant and shouldn't be done by a civil servant. Or they may be your program manager, who's probably the one person in your department who is making sure that the entire department prioritizes the program for government on which you were elected uh, and not the department's own priorities and views. Uh, these are the people who lose their jobs when you do. Uh, they're the only ones who are totally committed to achieving and implementing the program for government. And they may often be the only ones, other than yourself, who actually really believe in what you're trying to do. And that's why in most democracies, it's the norm for ministers to bring in their own cabinet of people with them. And they bring in many more than we do. The system is essential for effective government. Uh, and everyone in the Leinster House bubble, media and politicians know it but we're just afraid to say it, and I think we shouldn't be. But before I finish, I just really want to mention two more important points. Uh, the first relates to media ownership. Uh, no society, in my view, can benefit from an excessive concentration of media ownership in the hands of one individual or one company. We definitely do not want to have an Irish Murdoch or an Irish Berlusconi, uh, and legislation to address this is overdue, in my opinion. But in doing so, we must also bear in mind that no company enjoys a more dominant position on the radio, on the TV, or on the internet than RTE. RTE has a unique standing in Irish life. It performs an essential role and in many ways provides an excellent service. However, it also has the unique privilege of the license fee, and this carries with it very onerous responsibilities, namely the need to maintain high standards, consistent neutrality, and proven objectivity. Uh, there have been huge changes in RTE in recent months, but we must always ensure that the regulatory structures in place for such a dominant player in the Irish media are sufficient and effective. Uh, but of course, there can be no stronger challenge to dominance than diversity. And that's why it's been such a shame, in my view, to lose so many newspaper titles in recent years. And I really hope that we won't lose any more. I think we also need to guard against excessive foreign ownership of our press and broadcast media. There's plenty of room in Ireland for British-based and British-owned press. But we must also ensure that we maintain a vibrant Irish-owned uh, and Irish-based press. We don't want to reduce our television stations or our media to British newspapers or British programs with three or four minutes of Irish regional news tagged on. Uh, in conclusion, I think it's fair to say that we have a strong and vibrant and independent media in Ireland. A free pe press is not just a right, and without democracy it would not prevail. But part of the responsibility of the press is to respect democracy and not to undermine it, because without a free press, democracy will not prevail. Thank you.